Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar on the key IPCC report outcomes and solution to uh, respond to climate misinformation. Uh, my name is Nancy Van Nieuwenhove. I'm the Senior Project and Communication Officer uh, of the Monash Energy Institute. This webinar is one of the many energy literacy webinars we have been running over 2020 and 2021. Each webinar focused on research to better understand the current climate, showcase better business model, better technologies, better solution to accelerate the transition to a low carbon economy. Before we go further, I would like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional and original owner of the land that I'm speaking uh, to you from. So I'm calling from Hobart, Tasmania. So in my case, it is the Muinina people, and I pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. And I also acknowledge that people joining uh, this virtual meeting are doing so from other traditional uh, tribal land within uh, Australia, and I pay my respect to their elders as well. So the webinar will run for an hour. As we go, please uh, type your question in the Zoom uh, Q&A function, and we will do our best uh, to answer those at the end. So what are we going to talk about today? So you have probably heard that the UN Intergovernmental Panel on climate change released the 2021 report uh, last month. The IPCC report is the world's leading source of information about climate change. Uh, the, and we kind of know that the main drivers of climate change is of course the increasing atmospheric concentration of greenhouse uh, gases, with the most important uh, being the carbon uh, dioxide. A majority of the uh, increases of atmospheric CO2 come from burning fossil fuel and from uh, land clearance. How has the science evolved? Do we really know anything different about the climate system that we knew in 1995 when the first assessment report came out? What changed uh, since the previous IPCC report released seven years ago? While we have the IPCC report, which is actually evidence-based science, but robust, reliable, you know, um, very carefully analyzed. We also encounter um, climate misinformation from social media and sometimes even in real life. Australia overall proportion of uh, renewable is increasing, which is great, but we still derive uh, about 70% of our electricity power from fossil fuels and virtually all of our transport is powered by fossil fuels. So we need a way to bridge uh, the gap between the science and the politics because communication can rapidly become very political and emotional. And so our first speaker, Associate Professor Shane McGregor of the Monash School of Earth, Atmosphere and Environment will take us through the key IPCC report uh, findings. Shane is the lead author on chapter three of the IPCC report, so that focusing on human influence, his research straddle the boundaries of theory, observation, um, and modeling, and seek to understand climate variability and change, with a primary focus on the Australasian region. So I had to find a little fun fact about, about him. So I found, I found something. And when um, Shane is not doing climate work, or when he's not in COVID lockdown, unfortunately, um, Shane's favorite thing to do is surfing. Surfing and most often at Mornington Peninsula or a wave pool near the airport. Our second speaker, Dr. John Cook, is a researcher fellow with the Monash uh, Climate Change Communication Research Hub. John's research focus is on uh, using critical thinking to build a resilience against misinformation so in 2007, he founded Skeptical Called Science, a website that won uh, the 2011 Australian Museum Eureka Prize for the advancement of climate change knowledge. And in 2020, he published a book, Cranky Uncle versus Climate Change. And he has also uh, recently uh, created a game 
applying critical thinking, inoculating research, and cartoons to engage and educate readers about climate misinformation. He currently works with organizations like Facebook and NASA uh, to develop evidence-based response to climate misinformation. So I needed to find also a fun fact about him. And, and so John first got involved um, in the issue of climate change after an argument about global warming with his uh, father-in-law. So in preparation for the next family get together, he started collating a database of climate myth and uh, the scientific research relevant to each myth. And uh, this private database became or evolved into the skeptical science website, which is kind of awesome. So with no further ado, I'd like to hand over to Shane um, McGregor to take us through the findings in the latest IPCC report. Thank you, Shane. Thanks very much, Nancy, for the nice introduction. All right. Um, so I'm just going to go through, I suppose, some of the, the key messages from this uh, latest IPCC report. Um, but before we kind of get into that, a little bit of an overview if, you haven't, if you're not really aware of what it is and what's happening in the IPCC report. So it's, it's a United Nations report that's sent to assess our current state of knowledge on climate change, and it's updated you know, roughly every kind of seven years. So for this current report, we know there was uh, 12 chapters and one atlas. We had 234 authors that were involved. These stem from 65 countries. Um, in terms of the, the review process, so there was kind of basically two full reviews and then, and then a final kind of government review. Um, and throughout the review process, 78,000 comments were received and, and dealt with by, by the authors. So we had to respond to each and every one of those comments. And of the scientific publications, there was 14,000 scientific publications were assessed for this report, in this report. So it's these publications that basically form the backbone of, of the information that's presented within this report. All right, so moving on to kind of, I suppose, that the main the main findings of, of the report. Uh, and, and for me, I think the, the main kind of outcome was just that it was identified that the human influence on climate is unequivocal. Okay, there are, there are no questions anymore. There's not, uh, are we responsible for this portion or, or some small portion? We're responsible for the global warming and we're responsible for almost all of it. So I can, the, what I want to show here and the figure I wanted to the focus on is this kind of central panel, so panel B, um, where the black line here is the observed global mean surface temperatures from 1850 through to the year 2020. Um, you can see that the temperatures have been gradually rising and it's been this temperature increase kind of accelerated after 1950, um, where we've kind of had, basically, if you, if you look at the most recent 10-year period, it's about 1.1 degrees warmer than it was during the pre-1900 period. Yeah, another interesting aspect of this is if you're focusing on kind of the, the model representation of global mean temperature, this is depicted by this brown shading and, and the solid brown line. So this is climate models forced with human forcing, so changes in greenhouse gases, changes in, in um, you know, methane, and also um, natural forcing, so changes in, in solar activity, and change, changes in, in, in volcanic activity. And what we can see, there's a really close correspondence between the model results um, and, and the observed results, okay? So this gives us some confidence in the models. Also, you can see that the, I suppose the, the black line is contained, contained within that gray shading, which suggests there's a, there is a strong consistency between the two and the variability we're seeing um, in, in the observations is consistent with what we would expect to see from the climate models. Another aspect which is important is this set of simulations that are done with natural only forcings. So these are the forcings with solar and volcanic forcings only. So there are no um, human induced kind of changes in greenhouse gases um, or aerosols in these simulations. And what we can see is from about the kind of you know, 1960, the, the simulations kind of diverge um, very clearly from those with human forcings. And we can see that also the observations also diverge very clearly from these kind of, from this kind of green shaded range. So that gives us a lot of confidence that the warming we're seeing in the observations has nothing to do with natural variability. So then we can kind of move on and say, well, what aspects um, of, of, you know, what aspect of the climate system are humans, ch humans changing that are having the, the largest impact? So there's, we can kind of do a, a breakdown of the individual gases. So you can see in this far right-hand pop column, we can see carbon dioxide has the largest impact, the largest warming impact indicated by the, uh, 
the red or pink bars. Then we've got methane, and then you've kind of got nitrous oxide. But you can also see there are some things that we do that have a cooling impact. So this is the release of aerosols, like sulfate, sulfur dioxide. And sulfur dioxide, when it's in the atmosphere, acts to reflect incoming solar radiation and reduces the amount of radiation received at the surface and has this cooling impact. So if we look in this kind of uh, the panel B here, we can see that the total amount of warming due to greenhouse gases is actually around 1.5 degrees. And this is at least partially offset um, by, by other human drivers. So we're, you know, this is largely aerosol forcing. And it gets us down to this estimate of human induced kind of warming of the climate system of 1.7 degrees Celsius. Now this is very close to the 1.9 degrees Celsius of warming that we've actually experienced. So what we're saying with this is you can virtually explain all of the warming that we've seen with um, due to the human influence alone without really needing to, to rely on any form of natural variability. I suppose one of the, the, the best and probably newest aspects of this current IPCC report, which um, differentiates it from previous reports, is we, we can now say with a lot of confidence uh, and we can talk about extreme events and changes to extreme events in, in regions around the globe. So the first thing to get to this kind of regional level, the, the globe was divided up into different regions. And we can see that each of these regions are represented here by hexagons. Now, these hexagons represent kind of real, real climatic regions. Um, so you can see if we focus on the Australia, we've got North Australia, Central Australia, South Australia and Eastern Australia. And these are all depicted here in this kind of lower right hand side where these four hexagons are kind of glued together. This is done that this kind of cons consistent kind of sizing um, for each of the regions is done just for the clarity of, of the message. And the message of this figure is each one of these red boxes or the red hexagons suggesting we're seeing an increase in the number of heat extremes that are occurring um, in that particular region. So we can see of all the global regions, there are only four that are not displaying increases in heat extremes. Two of those we don't have enough data to assess and two of them have a low agreement in, in the type of change. So there might be differences um, in, in you know, different types of observations. And then if we think about, well, what, what is the confidence that we have in humans actually uh, producing these kind of climate changes? This is depicted by the dots in each one of those hectic hexagons. When we've got three dots, we have high confidence. When we've got two dots, we have medium confidence. So we can clearly see that a large majority of these hexagons that are red have three dots. So we're highly confident that humans are having um, an impact on increasing the uh, number of heat extremes in these regions. There were similar plots to this presented in, in the, the summary for policymakers for precipitation, um, ecological drought, and a range of others. And just due to time constraints, I'm not going to go through each of those now. But I've got the kind of main summary here is that human induced climate change is the main driver of increasing frequency and intensity of heat extremes. We've just been through that um, since the 1950s. It's also the main driver of increasing frequency and intensity of heavy precipitation events um, since the 1950s. There's an additional caveat here that the regions could be, a, uh, there was a limited number of regions that could be assessed. And of course, we can only assess those where observational data were sufficient for trend analysis. So it was a smaller number of regions than what was assessed for temperature. And there's a third outcome is that human induced climate change has also contributed to increases in agricultural and ecological drought in, in some regions. Now, this, um, the, these changes in agricultural and ecological drought are not due to changes in the mean rainfall. These are changes due to changes in temperature. So because we're having this increases in, in temperature and we're having similar levels of precipitation, the, the warmer weather leads to increased evaporation and evapotranspiration, which leads to a drying um, of the soil surface. All right, so this is around where we transition from talking about the past to talking about the future. Um, and to talk about the future, this um, assessment report relied on five different illustrative scenarios that were set forth by the um, CMIP-6. So this is the, the sixth instalment of, of, of these CMIP kind of climate model simulations. Um, you can see the, the greenhouse gas emissions. So this is carbon dioxide for these six different emission scenarios are shown here by the different color lines. And this is the amount of greenhouse gases that are released per year. So at present, we're kind of around that kind of 40 gigatons per year. And you can see for our high emission scenarios, this is suggesting the amount of carbon dioxide we release per year um, is going to increase, okay, right through to 2100 um, under the high and very high scenarios. 
under, under an intermediate scenario, it's suggesting um, that we're going to kind of level out, just gradually increasing our, you know, our kind of um, greenhouse gas usage somewhere over the next kind of, you know, 20 or so years, and then we'll kind of gradually taper off that usage. And then we've got the low emission scenario where we're quite abruptly kind of tapering down our greenhouse gas emissions kind of beginning very shortly. Um, and such that we're actually reaching negative emissions, you know, from 2040 to 2070, somewhere in that range. And negative emissions basically means we're taking more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere than we are releasing um, a, a, as humans. Um, there are lots of ways that you can do this. I'm not going to go into that at this point in time. Now, how much do these emission scenarios really influence the future? So to answer that question, we can kind of look at a, a graph like this, which will show our global mean surface temperatures relative to that um, uh, 1850 to 1900 range. So that zero is you know, the average temperature for 1850 to 1900. And what we can see for our very low emission scenario, so that's that uh, SSP 1-1.9, the average temperature at the tw year 2100 is around 1.5 degrees above those kind of pre-industrial levels. Whereas if we go for our high emission scenario, um, this SSP 5, dash A5, uh, the temperatures are around 4.5 to 5 degrees um, warmer than they were in those kind of pre-1900 values. So we can kind of see obviously the, you know, how much greenhouse gases we, we release between uh, now and the year 2100 has a huge impact on, on the temperatures we're going to experience in, in that amount of time. There's also an interesting point that comes up um, under the, you know, these, these five illustrative scenarios, if we start thinking about this 1.5 degree global warming level, which is highlighted by the, by the Paris Agreement set forth by, by uh, international governments around the world, we're very confident the, that this, this level of warming will be exceeded under the very high, high and intermediate greenhouse gas scenarios, and it will be exceeded kind of in the 2030s. So we're not looking that far in the future before this level of warming is exceeded. It's also likely to be exceeded um, in the short term under the even under the very low greenhouse gas emission scenario. And when I say likely, we're, we're talking about you know probabilities. You know, there's kind of a fifty to sixty percent chance we're going to uh, exceed that that limit um, within kind of the next twenty years. Also, but it's also likely that global mean surface temperatures will decline back to or below that one point five degree uh, Celsius limit by the end of the century if we follow those um, emission scenarios. So. You know, our, our, our emissions now and into the future will have a huge impact on, on the kind of the world we're going to be living in at 2100. And, and it is still possible to kind of um, limit warming or at least limit warming to below two degrees and hopefully end up on that 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, range. When you start to think about, you know, I suppose what life might look like, you know, when, when the world is four degrees warmer than, than it is now, um, I suppose you could just think, you know, I don't know, is, is it just simply going to be four degrees warmer? You know, I suppose that's your, your base, base assumption. Um, but it, what I want to highlight is there's, there's three plots across the bottom of this page, and this is simulated global warming uh, for different warming levels. So we've got 1.5 degrees on the left, three to four degrees on the right. And there are two key things that I kind of want you guys to, to notice from this plot. First is when we're talking about 1.5 degrees warming, what you'll actually see is the warming over land is larger than the global mean, or it's larger than what's happening over the ocean. So the warming over land is typically around one and a half times what's happening over the ocean. So for a 1.5 degree, degree global warming, we're actually talking you know, roughly two or more than two degrees of warming over land. The other thing that's uh, really prominent from these maps is as you're moving uh, towards the Arctic region, you'll see the colors you're getting at get, get much deeper. So we're getting experiencing more warming in the Arctic than you are over the rest of the globe. And this is called Arctic amplification. And it turns out Arctic amplification is, is normally uh, somewhere near a factor of two. So for a 1.5 degree global warming, we're experiencing three degrees warming in the Arctic region. For a four degrees global warming, we're experiencing roughly eight degrees of global warming in the, in the Arctic. And if you think about what impact this has on sea ice or, or glaciers kind of up around this region, it, it has the potential to have a huge impact. So the, so the level of warming really matters. Uh, if I have a look at um, precipitation changes, again, we're gonna focus um, going from the, from the left-hand side to the right-hand side of, of the page here, we can see that the, the, uh, the warming levels are increasing as we're moving from left to right. You can also see that the, the, the shading gets darker and darker as you're moving to the right. And what we're looking at here is 
uh, precipitation changes. Okay, so the green regions are saying it's going to be wetter than what it currently is, while the brown regions are saying it's going to be drier than what it currently is. So you can see a similar pattern in each of these figures, um, but, but the colours, you know, so the changes we're experiencing are going to be larger. So the, the changes are suggesting we'll see increasing precipitation in the polar regions, increasing precipitation kind of al along the equator where, where we normally have uh, the intertropical convergence zone. And then we have kind of decreasing precipitation in the, in the subtropics, so two stripes either side of that equatorial increase where we have these, these decreases. If I then kind of move on and have a look at, you know, how these warming levels might relate to extremes, and here, here I'm going to focus um, on, on the Australian region um, and the Australasian regions, including New Zealand. Um, and I suppose there, you know, there's three main kind of extremes that I want to have a look at here. But if we think about the annual annual maximum temperature, so for a, you, what we can see as we move down the page, the annual maximum temperature increases as you would expect. But what we also know is it doesn't just increase by the 1.5, but by the amount of the warming level. The, the rate of increase is larger than what the warming level is, and the occurrence of these heat waves um, at this level occurs much more often as we as we move down the page. So we know that the, the annual maximum temperature will increase with increasing warming levels, and those changes will be larger. It's a very similar result if we're thinking about the annual minimum temperatures, or you might think about that as you know the, the decreasing number of, of cold days. Um, and then on the on the far right hand column, we can look at our, our maximum precipitation. So this is the one day maximum precipitation of, of any given year. And what we can see is all of Australia are suggesting we're going to see these increases in this annual maximum precipitation. And what this means, it doesn't actually mean there's going to be an increase in, in the mean precipitation because the mean precipitation is in that third column, and I'll come back to that in a second. What it means is on those days where you do have heavy rain, the rainfall you're going to get is going to be even heavier in the future. So if you're thinking about you know, uh, river flow or potential flooding, the, those impacts have the potential to be larger in the future and how much larger depends on the rate of warming we're looking at. In terms of the annual mean precipitation changes just that Australia will experience, you can see that they're relatively small changes over the majority of Australia, um, but we have some quite large changes in the south and the southwest where you can kind of see um, widespread drying. This trend is consistent with what we've what has been observed over the last kind of 50 or so years um, and it's projected to, to increase and the, the level of warming is not going to impact this kind of level of drying. So again, it's, a, it's, a, it's another good reason to try and kind of limit our, our warming to some reasonable level. All right. Um, so what, what I'm, I suppose I'm, I'm kind of transitioning back um, from, from kind of spatial metrics where we're looking at maps of regions back to a, a global mean number here. And this is what I'm looking at, at sea level rise. And the main reason I'm doing this is because we know when we think about sea level rise, deviations from the global mean are, are relatively small. So the uh, sea level rise in one region will be between plus or minus 20% of the global average um, in the future. So we, so we know those regional differences are pretty small. I suppose there, there are three main points that, that I want to get across um, looking, thinking about sea levels moving forward. If we're thinking about the sea levels around 2050, so this is, you know, in, in kind of 30 years from now, the emissions between now and 2050 will have little impact um, on, on, on the radar, on, on the sea level rise we'll experience. So on average, we're thinking it's going to be around 20 centimetres of sea level rise by 2050. Uh, and like I said, the, the rate of emissions between now and then doesn't have an impact on that. The, the, the sea level changes basically lag global mean surface temperature changes. So the, the changes we will experience in the next 30 years are kind of um, due to changes in greenhouse gas emissions of the past. But the next 30 years of emissions has the, has the potential to impact sea level rise at 2100. So whether we end up on you know, the low emission scenario with 50, you know, roughly 50 centimetres of sea level rise or the high emission scenario with roughly 80 centimetres of sea level rise, they're the emissions that we're talking about are, are important for the next. So the emissions over the next 30 years are important for that. There's also an additional um, storyline that's presented here, and this is this dashed line in the upper panel. This is something that hasn't been presented in other um, IPCC reports. And this covers this kind of low likelihood scenario 
that I suppose our understanding um, of ice sheets and how they'll respond to warming might be slightly off. And, and what that means is that they may they melt may melt faster, or the glaciers may move down um, move downhill, kind of flowing into the ocean faster than what we're expecting. So the sea level rises um, due to this ice sheet collapse and glacier collapses might occur faster than what we're expecting. So if we can think about that scenario, it's it, like it is a low likelihood scenario, but it's a possible scenario. We're talking about sea level rises at, at the year 2100 of around 1.7 to 1.8 meters. Now these are very, very large changes. And if you're thinking out to, to 2300, they're actually suggesting that the changes in sea level we're seeing could, it could get up to 15 meters. Now, while these are unlikely, these changes are not impossible. And what we do know is the more warming um, we get through, so the higher the level of global warming we get to, the more likely we are to see these low likelihood outcomes. So I, again, um, you know, it, it's in our, our best interest to try and kind of stick to that, uh, that the globally international government agreed kind of 1.5 to 2 degree uh, limit. All right, so this is kind of my, my uh, final kind of slide of the presentation. And I suppose it depicts basically our understanding of, of the climate system as, as we think. And it also displays something which is referred to as the climate sensitivity. So on, on the x-axis here, we have the cumulative carbon dioxide emissions since, since 1850, okay? Um, and on the y-axis, we have uh, the global mean temperature. And what we know is as we're releasing greenhouse gas emissions, the amount that's accumulating in the atmosphere is increasing and this leads to increasing uh, global mean surface temperatures. So we're kind of currently at this point kind of here where we're at the end of this kind of grey shaded region and we can see we're just over one degrees of warming. Okay, and how far um, kind of, I suppose, up this relationship or how, how far we travel to the right of this relationship depends on how much greenhouse gases we release between now and then. And what we do know is for us to reach the, the Paris target of 1.5 degrees, we roughly have about 400 uh, to 500 gigaton gigatons of carbon to release. We know globally we're releasing around kind of 40 gigatons per year. So this is giving us kind of on the order of a, a decade um, to kind of get our greenhouse gas emissions organised. Otherwise, we, we're, we're going to breach this kind of 1.5 degrees Celsius um, mark. So these, these, these were some, I suppose, kind of really confronting results. And I think there was a, a lot, we have a lot more certainty about where we're going and how quickly we're going to get there than what's been portrayed in previous reports. And I just wanted to, to kind of come back to a few kind of newspaper articles um, that were released in, in the, you know, in the days before the IPCC report. And there was this kind of focus around um, climate models. You know, there was talk of climate models running hot or that most scientists um, believe, you know, that the temperatures in these models are, are rising implausibly fast. And there was this discussion in, in, in my mind um, was used to kind of discredit, uh, you know, some of the things that were being uh, uh, some of the statements being made by the IPCC report. And they're raising questions like, well, is it true that climate models are, you know, with a high sensitivity given over the pessimistic or alarmist, alarmist view of the, of, of the climate change? And I suppose the answer to that question would, would be yes, if they were the only models you looked at. But we, we use 50 different climate models, okay, and if you're thinking about, you know, this, we actually had, you know, there was a handful of models that were a little bit warmer than models we'd experienced in the past. And there was also a handful of models that actually projected cooler temperatures than um, we had experienced in the past. So we knew, um, we generally assess this thing called climate sensitivity with three main methods. One of the methods is with numerical models. Another method is using paleoclimatic observations and observations of the past. So basically just relying on this kind of gray portion of the line that's plotted on the left-hand side to look, identify that relationship between carbon dioxide and global mean temperature. And the other method is through our actual physical understanding of the climate system, just understanding you know, the radiative effect of carbon dioxide itself and how, how much the concentrations change and how much will that, that will lead to warming. So I think one of the things, we had this one aspect where we had some models that were kind of warming faster and we understand why those models were warming faster and because we knew that those models were unrealistic, we could rule them out without having to, to take them into account. So they, they had kind of little impact, but it was kind of, I suppose it was a really interesting aside in the lead up to this report that before it even came out, there was, it felt like there was a, an active discussion to try and uh, reduce the impact of the messaging that would come out from this report. So I just want to come back to the, is there any good news? Because quite often 
I don't know, with, with you know, statements like this um, that, that have come out, it, it is a little bit uh, disencouraging. And I think there are some good points. From my perspective, the good points of the IPCC report are that our knowledge of climate change and its causes is vastly more robust than it has been um, in, in previous reports. We're, we're now well aware that um, of the action required to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. We, we're well aware of the timeframes we have and, and how... Um, and how we can achieve these kind of clear targets. So we've got these clear targets in mind. Uh, we also are aware that um, we've got, if we can reach net zero soon, we can get on top of, on top of climate change. And can, we can stop, um, you know, reaching, you know, minimize our chances of reaching these tipping points, like uh, melting vast parts of Greenland and Antarctica, Antarctic ice sheets, leading to this higher instability and higher sea level rises. Um, and we're also well aware that many extremes are linked to global mean temperature. So limiting our warming um, in the future will also re uh, reduce the chances of extremes. And it's really important to note that I think every little bit of warming we reduce counts, right? So 1.5 degrees is better than 1.6 degrees or, or 1.8 degrees is better than 1.9. So for me personally, that means every action you can take as, as an individual matters, right? Whether you've chosen to, to start catching the train instead of driving your car, all of these little bits matter. And the more of us that do this, the better off we will be. I also believe that at, on an individual level, the things we can do um, that, that are important are, are voting, um, voting, voting for governments with policies that you believe in. I just want to kind of come to this figure in the bottom right hand side of this slide that talks about um, Australian government commitments um, to, to climate change and we can look at the 2030 targets or the 2050 targets you can see each of the individual states has actually a, a net zero 2050 target um, and and the only I suppose government that doesn't have a net zero target is the Australian federal government. Okay, so individually states are, are kind of targeting this and it's the federal government that's lagging behind. If we look for a 2030 target, we can see New South Wales, Victoria, uh, South Australia, Tasmania, and the ACT have, have kind of very vast reductions in, in mind. So they're kind of putting us on this pathway that we need. Um, so so I, I think there, there's a lot of reasons um, to, to be positive about the changes that, that we're, um, you know, that we can make the changes that are required. So on that, I'll, I'll leave Thank it Thank you. Out. Thank you so much, uh, Shane. Um, yeah, it was very good to get that overview of uh, the key finding of the IPCC report. And as you mentioned, yes, we don't have to desperate. Yes, every little action uh, counts. But I can understand for lots of climate uh, scientists, it's kind of frustrating uh, that we continue as a community to put out new uh, reports with great science, but the take home message doesn't, uh, doesn't really, um, you know, it's not heard properly. So IPCC report, very important piece of the puzzle, uh, focusing on the science of climate change, but we need also something else. And, and that's where John, uh, will bridge the gap between uh, the science and uh, the, the politics. Maybe. John, over to you. Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, the problem of misinformation and how we can respond to it. And uh, I think it's, it's an important uh, question to ask at, at the very beginning of this topic is, why do we need to? Um, uh, and I actually kind of encounter that that kind of... I wouldn't say it's an objection within the scientific community, but maybe a reluctance or, or a querying on can't we just communicate the science and ignore misinformation and science denial? Uh, and so I think it's a, a legitimate question. Why do we need to address misinformation? Uh, and uh, I'll just share a recent study that was published just over the last year that was a meta-analysis of a whole range of different studies in climate communication studies that looked at what happens when people receive information about climate change, whether it's accurate information or misinformation or both. Now, the, um, the blue curve down the bottom is, is accurate information about climate change. And what they found was it was on average a, a positive effect. But the red curve is uh, what happened when people were shown misinformation. And there you saw a strong negative effect, reducing people's attitudes about climate change. Um, and it was a much stronger negative effect 
than the positives you get from climate information, accurate information, which I found a little bit depressing. Uh, but the, the really, I think, important thing to recognize here is the blue curve in the middle. This is what happened when people were shown both accurate information and climate misinformation. On average, um, they canceled each other out. When people are presented fact and myth, conflicting pieces of information, and they don't know how to resolve that conflict, then the danger is that they disengage and they believe neither. And this means that as scientists, communicators, educators, when we um, are trying to communicate the facts about climate change, those efforts can be cancelled out by misinformation. Uh, and to me, this answers the question, why do we have to worry about misinformation? If we ignore it, then we run the danger of, of our efforts to communicate being cancelled out and we leave the public vulnerable to misinformation. So communicating the facts of climate change is necessary, but it's insufficient given the presence of misinformation. Over the last 15 years, I've been working on um, countering misinformation about climate change, uh, developing different strategies. And what I've learned over 15 hard years is uh, a couple of things. Firstly, the problem of misinformation is complicated and it's getting more and more complicated. It's gotten much more complicated over the last 15 years I've been working on this. Uh, and part of the reason why is because the problem is interconnected. You have technological issues like social media platforms spreading misinformation and the way that their algorithms um, uh, channel different pieces of information to different audiences. You have psychological issues where, um, where people process information in, in different ways. They, um, once misinformation gets stuck, it's really difficult to dislodge it. Uh, this is just basic cognitive psychology. And we have cultural issues with climate change getting more and more polarized over the years. That makes it harder and harder to, to get progress, um, both on climate action, but even on just the simple uh, task of communicating climate facts and, and getting a more climate literate public. The fact that climate change or climate misinformation is so interconnected means that um, if our solutions to misinformation are piecemeal and just focusing on one part of the problem, that tends to be inadequate. Uh, and instead, what we need when developing solutions to climate change are more holistic and interdisciplinary uh, solutions. So let me give an example of what I mean by that. Say, for example, you want to develop a, an intervention on a, on a social media platform like Twitter where misinformation gets flagged um, and you warn people, hey, this, this tweet might be misinformation. So you're trying to come up with a technological solution to misinformation. The problem is if you put a warning on a social media platform, but you ignore the psychology of how people process information, then you run the risk of the warning um, being either ineffective or potentially even backfiring and making people uh, want to click on that, that misinformation even more. And there have been studies that have found that if you uh, debunk or pre-bunk misinformation in the wrong way, it can be either ineffective or even counterproductive. So technological solutions need to incorporate um, uh, the best practices that have come from psychological research. That's one example of how we need to be more interdisciplinary and bring different disciplines into, into our solutions to misinformation. So over the last 15 years of kind of developing all these different uh, strategies to misinformation, um, just in the last couple of years, I've started to sort of take a step back and try to make sense of it and, and, and organize it into these four themes detecting, deconstructing, debunking and uh, misinformation, and then deploying solutions to, to counter misinformation. And the work I've done has been focused on um, misinformation about climate change. So really mostly science related misinformation. Um, and I'm just going to give you some examples of, of what I've been doing in these four themes. And then having shown you climate change examples, then uh, 
discuss how how this approach can be applied to other topics as well. Um, firstly, on the topic of detecting misinformation. Um, for the last couple of years now, this has been a very long research project, I've been working with some political scientists from the UK uh, using machine learning to detect and categorize climate, climate science, or not just climate misinformation in general. Uh, and uh, actually this paper is, is just about to come out now. So it's, um, it's been a long time coming. Uh, and in order to detect and categorize misinformation, first you need to build a landscape of all the different types of misinformation claims you might see. Uh, and so this was really the first step of this research was building a taxonomy of climate misinformation claims. Um, what we found when we built this taxonomy was um, the first three categories were science related. They were arguing either that global warming wasn't happening, wasn't caused by humans, or the impacts wouldn't be too bad. The fourth category was related to climate solutions. Uh, generally, um, either saying that climate solutions wouldn't work or that they would be harmful. Uh, and the last category uh, was arguments that tried to cast doubt or undermine climate science, either by attacking the science, attacking the climate models, which is what Ashain just uh, mentioned earlier, or uh, attacking scientists themselves. So what, what we did then in our research was we basically trained a machine learning model to detect these different categories. And then we took 20 years of articles from either um, climate denial blogs or conservative think tank websites. And we fed that into our machine learning model in order to build a 20 year history of climate misinformation. Uh, and this is what we found. Here are the five categories of climate misinformation over the last 20 years as seen in conservative think tank websites. And uh, to be honest, I found these results surprising. It was not what I expected. Firstly, the bottom three lines here, the green, the yellow, the blue, these were those first three science related categories. It's not real, it's not us, it's not, um, it's not bad. And this is where most of the fact checking, the debunking about climate misinformation is done. It's where most of the research into climate misinformation is focused on those bottom three categories. And it was quite surprising to me that they were the least common forms of climate misinformation. Much more common was that fifth category, attacking science itself, the orange line. Uh, and uh, especially in climate denial blogs, but also here, it was a much more common uh, category of misinformation. Uh, it tells us that uh, climate misinformation's main purpose isn't to provide alternative explanations of climate change or, or how our climate system works. It's about undermining public trust in climate science. Uh, the other thing, obviously, the probably the biggest um, uh, result that jumped out of, of this data was the fact that uh, misinformation targeting climate solutions was not only the biggest category, but it's, uh, ha it's been having an increasing proportion over the 20 year period, such that it's now by far the biggest category of climate misinformation and will only become more so in time. So uh, this tells us that misinformation targeting climate solutions really is the future of climate misinformation. And we're going to be seeing more and more of it over time. But I want to just uh, jump back at, uh, and look at the climate solutions um, category as uh, as well in terms of the the subcategories because cap that climate solutions won't work is kind of the overarching category. But underneath that, you had a whole uh, set of different subcategories, and we found that four point one the saying that climate policies will be harmful, and four point four uh, arguing that clean energy uh, wouldn't work or was harmful were the most common categories of, of solutions misinformation. Uh, and here um, was the time series of both categories of misinformation over, over that period. So we see that um, firstly, uh, arguing that climate policies are harmful is, is the biggest category within solutions misinformation. Um, and both of the categories are, are on the increase. But 
attacking climate policies and attacking clean energy. The other interesting thing just to point out in this one is the big spike in late 2009. This was in the lead up to COP, uh, COP19, I think, in Copenhagen. Uh, there's a similar but not quite as big spike in the lead up to uh, COP25 in Paris. Uh, so we see in our data that when you lead up to these significant um, international climate summits, there's a surge in misinformation attacking climate policy. Uh, and we're expecting to see a similar thing over the next month leading up to the COP in Glasgow uh, in the first weeks of November. So that, um, this kind of research is helpful in, in understanding better the patterns of past misinformation in order to anticipate what future misinformation is going to be. The second um, category or the second theme in the 4D project is deconstructing misinformation. Now, to do this, I worked with two um, critical thinking philosophers from the University of Queensland, Peter Allison and David Kincaid. And what we did in this paper published in 2018 in Environmental Research Letters was we developed a step-by-step -step methodology, this is a simplified version of it, of um, deconstructing and analyzing misinformation. What we found was having this three-step process where you firstly take a claim, break it up into an argument structure, um, where every argument has the structure of premises leading to a conclusion. Then check whether the argument is logically valid, uh, then check the premises. Uh, and by, go by going through this step-by-step -step methodology, it's a systematic and reliable way of identifying firstly, are there any reasoning fallacies in the misinformation? And if there are, you can more surgically identify where in the argument is the fallacy and what is the fallacy. And that's, um, once you've identified that, you can use that information to be able to debunk the misinformation more effectively. Let me give you an example to make this a bit more concrete. So a common argument, um, in fact, one of the most, um, I think, potent climate myths is the argument that, that there's no scientific consensus on climate change because 31,000 science graduates have signed a statement saying that, that humans aren't disrupting climate. Uh, this is known as the Global Warming Petition Project or the Oregon Petition. Um, and some studies by Sander Vanderlyn have found that it's one of the most effective climate myths in reducing people's climate perceptions. Uh, so when you deconstruct this claim into a, the argument structure of premises and conclusion, you get this. Um, first premise is that a large percentage of science graduates disagree about human caused global warming. And the second premise or starting assumption is that if someone has a science degree, that makes them an expert in climate change. And the conclusion is that uh, there's no scientific consensus on climate change. And by breaking arguments up into this, this structure, it allows you to more surgically identify where does the argument go wrong. In this case, both premises are false. The first uh, premise is false because 31,000, while it seems like a big number, is a tiny fraction of the millions of people who have science degrees in the US. Uh, and the second premise is false because just because you have a science degree doesn't automatically um, convey expertise in other topics. Uh, and when you look at the 31,000 signatories of this petition, the vast bulk of them uh, have no expertise in climate science. They're, they have degrees in computer science, veterinary science, medical science, engineering, but less than 1% of them have actual climate science expertise. So we took this methodology of deconstructing and analyzing misinformation, climate misinformation, and we applied it to around 50 of the most common myths that you see about climate change. And by going through that process, we were able to identify what are the reasoning fallacies in each claim. Um, and, and having that list of reasoning fallacies then served as a resource for anyone wanting to develop debunkings of misinformation of, of at least these specific climate maps. If you want to identify 
uh, reasoning fallacies in misinformation, you need to have a framework for, for describing the fallacies. Uh, and so at the same time that uh, I've been working on these methods for deconstructing misinformation, I've also been building up a, a landscape of, of all the different um, rhetorical techniques and logical fallacies that you might find in misinformation. And it's this is uh, not a comprehensive list, but it's it's most of the fallacies that you are likely to find in climate misinformation. Uh, and it's a lot to take in. Um, I'm not gonna explain it all now, I uh, don't have time. Happy to answer any questions about it. And I will come back to the challenge of having such a big landscape of, of denial techniques later on and how do you um, educate the public about them. The third theme of the 4D project is debunking misinformation. Uh, and this is actually like my discipline is cognitive science and I've mainly been focused on running experiments, testing different types of debunkings. But I just want to um, just focus on one, one experiment that I published uh, back in 2017 with um, Stefan Lewandowski and Ulrich Ecker, uh, looking at the approach of uh, inoculation as a way to counter misinformation. In psychology, um, inoculation theory takes the idea of vaccination and applies it to knowledge. Um, 50 years of inoculation theory research has found that exposing people to a weakened form of misinformation builds up their immunity so that when they encounter the actual misinformation, they're less, less likely to be misled. In my research, what we tested was uh, coincidentally that, that global warming petition project that I, um, I mentioned earlier, we tested what happens when people are shown this misinformation. And we found that uh, overall, it had a negative effect, but it didn't have the same negative effect on everyone. Um, the horizontal axis in this graph is political ideology. And what I found was the more politically conservative people were, the bigger the effect of the misinformation in reducing their, their climate perceptions. But um, for another group in my experiment, I showed them an inoculating message before showing them the misinformation. And the, the inoculating message didn't actually mention the Global Warming Petition Project at all. Instead, what it did was it focused on the technique used to mislead fake experts. And then it used the tobacco industry uh, and how they use that technique to cast doubt on the link between smoking and cancer. What I found was when people were inoculated before being shown the misinformation, the misinformation was neutralized. Uh, and although there's a slight slope in this line, statistically it's equivalent to a flat line. Uh, the misinformation was neutralized across the political spectrum. So this tells us a couple of things. Firstly, that uh, nobody likes being misled, whether you're on the right end of the political spectrum or the left end, uh, nobody likes to, to be tricked. So explaining techniques used to mislead uh, can neutralize those techniques. It also tells us that you can neutralize misinformation without even mentioning it, even across topics. I neutralized or I, or I inoculated people against a technique used by the tobacco industry and found that it uh, inoculated people against the same technique uh, in climate change. So this logic-based approach to um, inoculating people or logic-based inoculation is what we call it, um, can, can generalize, it can work across topics. The fourth theme of the 4D project is deploying. Once you've detected the misinformation you wanted, you, that needs responding to, you've deconstructed it and you've developed your debunking messages, how do you get it out in front of eyeballs? How do you get it out and scale it up to the point we can actually shift the needle and um, build enough immunity amongst the public that the misinformation no longer has a significant effect. And uh, the answer to that is there are many different ways you can do it. We've, um, we've done it through websites um, such as the Skeptical Science website, which debunks um, the most common myths about climate change. We, the Skeptical Science team worked with the University of Queensland to develop a massive open online course, which uh, looked at the most common myths about climate change and explained the fallacies in each 
in each myth. Uh, last year, I published the book, Cranky Uncle versus Climate Change, which combined cartoons and critical thinking to explain the um, misinformation fallacies using a technique called parallel argumentation. And the cartoon on the right is an example of that. Parallel argumentation takes a myth like cold weather disproves global warming and transplants that logic into a different analogous situation like arguing nighttime disproves the sun. Obviously that's a ridiculous argument, but it's the same logic as arguing that cold weather disproves global warming. And the, the book uses that critical thinking approach um, combined with humor and cartoons as a way to um, inoculate people against misinformation. Uh, and also uh, I've, over the last year, I've been working with Facebook to also develop fact checks or debunkings of misinformation. And while they're very short, they're just a couple of paragraphs of text, they still incorporate all those findings from the psychological research, um, dislodging myths with facts uh, and explaining the techniques that the myths use to distort the facts and then combining that in a single debunking. But I want to come back to the uh, techniques of denial um, as, um, the, as a last kind of point. Now, as I said, was saying earlier, um, raising public awareness about all these different techniques is a real communication and education challenge because it, it's, there's so much to not only just become aware of, but then also internalize it to the point where you can spot these techniques in, in real world misinformation. Uh, so how do you... How do you do that in a way that um, can people can learn these techniques deeply enough that, that they can um, become practically inoculated against these techniques or be able to spot them in the wild? And, and to try to achieve this, I've turned to gamification. Um, games uh, are a way of, of inoculating the public against misinformation um, in a scalable way so you can reach um, big numbers but also by using the tools of game, game play to incentivize players to, to um, play the game longer. Uh, the, the way that this game works, it's called Cranky Uncle. Um, it's, a, it's a smartphone game, but people can also play it in browsers. And the game uh, ex explains the techniques of science denial from, from this uh, taxonomy. And once they've learned the techniques of science denial, it has the players practice spotting them in examples of misinformation. So as players play the game and they look, they look at more and more examples and they build up points and they level up and so using all those gameplay elements to incentivize them to get deeper and deeper into the game. And the more they practice through these uh, quizzes, the quicker and better they get at spotting misinformation. So, uh, Games offer that that potential to um, to give people a deeper uh, understanding of the techniques used to mislead. Uh, and what I've found is that educators are crying out for these kind of interactive resources. And while it's mainly because the game's currently only available in English, um, it's mainly been in the US where the game's been picked up. Although um, we're currently translating it into uh, a number of languages. Nancy will be happy to hear that it's also in French uh, while we're currently translating it in French. And interestingly, the French translation, um, the volunteers who are helping are based in France, Canada, I think Belgium uh, and Tunisia. So it's, a, it's uh, across three different continents uh, um, is, is the game being translated into French, which I think is pretty cool. Last thing I wanted to talk about was this framework, the 4D framework, um, how, how can it be applied to other topics? Because I initially developed it just to tackle the problem of climate science misinformation, but over time realized that this framework is very generalizable and have now started collaborating with other people working in other areas. For example, I'm working with um, reef experts up in Queensland who have to deal with misinformation about the Great Barrier Reef and, and uh, the research that uh, reef scientists are producing. And uh, we're in the process right now of um, 
we're in the detect stage basically we've we've built a long list of the types of myths that they're encountering and now we're using um expert elicitation basically a survey of 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 people working in this area just to prioritize what are the most common myths that they've encountered in a completely different topic and this is way out of left field for me but i've started working with people who uh are working to counter misinformation about lead ammunition, which I didn't even know was a thing until this year. But, um, and we're, we're now at the stage of deconstructing the most common myths about lead ammunition that are promoted by groups like the National Rifle Association, the NRA in the US. Um, and so what I'm finding is that um, this deconstruction approach, this three-step approach of breaking arguments up into premises and conclusions and then analyzing them to find reasoning fallacies works just as effectively for this topic as it did for climate science misinformation but i've also found that you do need content expertise um, i can't come at a at a lead ammunition myth cold without any content knowledge and be able to properly deconstruct and identify the fallacy without that background knowledge that that the experts that I'm working with have. Uh, and lastly, um, on the deploy front, uh, I'm currently uh, collaborating with UNICEF to develop a extra little section in the Cranky Uncle game that specifically addresses misinformation about vaccines. Uh, and, and our goal there is to, to inoculate the public against vaccine misinformation, kind of a poetic thing really, vaccinating people against myths about vaccines um, and, and the idea there is to take that logic-based inoculation approach um, but apply it to a, a very specific topic. Uh, lastly, I just want to um, come back to a point I mentioned earlier, which is that climate solutions is the future of climate misinformation. It's already dominant and it's only going to become more and more prominent. Um, and so what I'm hoping to do, and it was kind of really the main reason I wanted to give this presentation, was I'm hoping to apply the 4D framework to climate solutions misinformation. But as I said, um, this process requires content expertise. So I was hoping to find um, people working in climate policy, in, in uh, renewable energy, people with content expertise who are interested in tackling the problem of climate solutions misinformation. Uh, and I will finish by just providing my contact details. So anyone who's interested in, in collaborating on working on that problem, I would love to hear from you. So please feel free to reach out to me. I'll stop there and look forward to the questions. Okay, fantastic. Thank you for both your presentation and all your hard work in pulling this together. So we have quite a few questions here. Uh, this first question from Simon Torok is for both John and Shane. John, do you think that, that the IPCC should address misinformation when communicating climate science? And how effective do you and Shane think the IPCC was in communicating climate science for general audiences? Okay. Uh, I, I'm, I'm happy. I, I'll, I'll have a quick go at this, John, and then and you can kind of come in because you, we probably have different perspectives. Um, I, I think on this, from from being inside the IPCC, I think they put a lot of effort to, into ensuring we, as much as they can, there is clear communication and um, clear communication coming from the individual authors. We all kind of uh, sit around and attend various meetings about kind of the key points that we're kind of meant to, to reiterate on and, and kind of thinking about the kind of questions that will come back and how we can best deal with them. To basically, I, I think every individual person would have probably different ways to answer individual questions that are being asked and they're trying to kind of come at it with kind of using this framework, you know, here's kind of five different ways that you can answer these particular each of these particular questions. So at least we're all kind of coming at it from, from on the same page. So I think there is a lot of effort from, from the IPCC to kind of clarify the metrics. I also think, so Scott asked a question, sorry, about stippling um, on the panels that I indicated and they, they, re 
remove the stippling from the figures that get presented in public to, to make them simpler to interpret, to, to, to clarify that messaging. So I think there's some real intent to clarify the, the messaging. Now I'll go over to John and he, he might be able to answer the, the question about how effective it was. You kind of touched on a sore point, Simon, because um, in 2014, I actually went to a communication conference run by the RPCC and I basically made that point. My talk was to say, I think that the RPCC does need to address misinformation more explicitly um, because of the reasons I basically outlaid in that first slide, that if, if we don't, then we leave the facts vulnerable to being undermined by misinformation. Um, and they, their response was, yeah, nah. <laughs> and so they, they were reluctant. I can understand the reluctance because there's this perception that addressing misinformation is a negative and confrontational thing. Um, and, and it doesn't need to be. Um, there's a lot of educational research showing that misconception-based learning or explaining the science by addressing misconceptions about the science is actually one of the most powerful ways of teaching science. Uh, and I think that they could have taken that approach. So that, that's not to say, like, I don't want to bag the IPCC. I think that they are the most important source of climate information in the world. Um, and and the most reliable, um, but uh, because of that, I think that they could have um, made great steps in in addressing misinformation. So, um, yeah, <laughs> that answers that question. So I, I'm not sure if things change between the last time and this time, but we definitely got prepared. That we were we were given um, you know asked questions in, in preparation, saying these are the kind of, you know, this is the kind of questions you, you will be asked this time around. And there was kind of questions about, you know, the, the, the models running hot and kind of, you know, what's new. And, and also I was involved in developing um, for one of the frequently asked questions. And that was, you know, it, it kind of particularly targets these areas that people often misunderstand. So the, the question I um, had to kind of write the response for was, you know, how much of recent climate change can be explained by by natural variability? Because quite often that is, you know, one of them, one of these you know, these kind of climate myths, right? Um, so, so I think, you know, I, maybe things have changed in, a, in, the, in the iterations, but I think there's definitely more of a focus this time around. Here a question from Scott Power. Thanks, Shane. Why did the AR16 decide to drop stippling indicators of extent to which models agree on signs of change? Yeah, I, I think I think if you had a look at old IPCC reports, there would be a map and there would be kind of regions that were stippled or they would have hatching on it. And that would show that you know the level of agreement, you know, models might predicted predicting temperatures in, in that region. So it might be on the sign of the change, whether you're having a rainfall increase or a rainfall decrease or, or something like that. Uh, and the answer to Scott is we, we didn't actually drop them this time around, Scott. So they're in the main chapters. They were only dropped for the summary, summary for policymakers. There's yeah. also a question on, on CO2 sources and why don't, do, do or do not the IPCC factor in natural CO2 sources in their reports? And, and they actually have a very detailed um, schematic showing all natural and anthropogenic CO2 sources. It's actually a bit of a bit of a brain melt looking at <laughs> that figure because there's so much information in there. Uh, and what that shows is that while there are big flows of CO2 in, in our climate system, like the oceans and the forests are emitting heaps of CO2, but nature is also absorbing um, roughly equal amounts. Uh, and so one climate myth is that, that human emissions are small compared to natural CO2 emissions, but that myth doesn't count, take into account that natural absorptions match natural emissions. When they cancel each other out, um, what we're doing with our 30 billion tonnes of CO2 every year, or roughly, um, is disrupting that natural balance. And that's why we've seen CO2 going up over the last century, it's increased roughly 40% from pre-industrial pre times. Um, and so nat natural sources uh, overall, the net natural sources are dwarfed by human uh, CO2 emissions. Yeah. There's a similar question in the chat from um, Adam uh, asking about kind of the, the including um, CO2 from volcanoes. Um, so so they, they are included, but I, I, I looked at the, the link you, you sent, Adam, 
Um, and, and it was talking about, you know, 12 to 14 kind of kilotons of carbon dioxide being released kind of per day, which um, is relatively small compared to the, the, the 40 gigatons of carbon dioxide humans released every, every year. Um, so, it, it, like John says, it, it is included, um, and you know that those volcanic emissions they they are small compared to what we are actually doing. And here we have a question from Professor Ariel Liebman, um, and here is the question for Shane: SSP five dash eight point five is the money shot. So if the probability of this is any more than 0.1%, say, then we should be pulling out all the stops. What is the probability of this one? Well, it's just like, what's the probability of that uh, extreme scenario? Um, is, it, is that the sea level one? The, yeah, yeah, SSP 5-8.5 degrees, I guess. Or? Well, uh, th so the, the, that scenario itself, so that was just a, a possible future. And I suppose th there's no real likelihood on that. It depends on our choices. Um, I, don't, I don't think we're going to assume some kind of probability that we'll go down that pathway. But if we don't change, that's the pathway we are heading in, in the future. Currently, well, if, you, if, if you're kind of tracking back through our emissions, so to get off that pathway, we have to actively change. Um, yeah, change our emissions and shift to kind of green, green energy. I think that, that pathway is assuming... Uh, it's normally in previous reports that's referred to as kind of like the business as usual and it's assuming a you know continued population growth All right. so, so that's actually a high likelihood scenario if we don't change yeah, yeah. so that should be like our um uh, what's the word uh, uh, the precautionary principle says this is what's going to happen if we don't do anything so and this is a disastrous one is, is that the right way to think about it yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. I, th I think it's a disastrous scenario, and I, I really hope, uh, hope we don't get there. So. Actually, I forgot to ask a question that I had during your presentation, Shane, which was the the one with the with the nightmare ice mm. uh, sea level rise um, scenario. Yeah. Is that a binary thing, or or could could we get like so? You have just sort of the more the mainstream <clears throat> sea level rise projections, and then you have that. Oh my God! The ice is, is destabilized yeah. and collapsed, or whatever. Yeah. Can it be degrees of that, or is it just it either collapses or it doesn't? That, well, that, I, I believe that's like the, on the eighty-seven point five kind of percentile range, you know, of, of the possible ranges. So what's normally reported is just the median, and, and I, I think just our understanding of ice sheets and kind of glaciers during kind of melting um, is very. Uh, I think there's a lot of unknowns. And there's a lot of assumptions are made in the model, and that's kind of assuming, you know, what, what if things are going to happen faster than what we expect. So, and I think, you know, how much faster than we expect can they occur? I think that was kind of like an estimate of it, you know. So I think they're saying it's, you know, 60 metres of sea level rise contained in ice sheets on Antarctica alone. Um, so so it's, it's, it's big. On behalf of the Monash Energy Institute and myself, I would like to thank Associate Professor Shane McGregor and Dr. John Cook for their fabulous presentation, Larissa Teterevkova and Dr. Roger Dargaville for their help with these events and the many participants that engaged in this webinar today. So thank you everyone and enjoy the rest of your day.